Seriously, I haven't slept in four days, and I feel great. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Collider Mailbag. My name is Mark Ellis. I am thrilled to be here with you kids on an early Saturday morning talking about everything that you guys have sent in during the week. You guys can always email us, collidervideo at gmail.com. We get to as many of your questions on Movie Talk and here today on Mailbag. What a panel I have assembled. I drove to their house. I woke them up out of a sound slumber, and they're here with me. First off, Miss Sinead DeFries, how are you? I'm good. It was really hard to get up this morning, you guys, but I'm here. I'm excited to be here. The cold bucket of water I dumped on your head might have had something to do with that. And then an easier wake up I had today was Miss Perry Nemero. Yeah, but you didn't buy me any coffee. Where no. Where is my coffee? No, that's a, that's a premium package. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> and only I get the iced tea. Thank you, Starbucks. Is it really iced tea? It is totally iced tea <laughs> and a little bit of vodka. Sinead, what's our first question? All right, Brittany Rodriguez writes, how heavily do you think episode eight needs to feature Luke in their marketing? One of the biggest draws for Force Awakens was Han Solo, Leia, and even the Millennium, Millennium, Millennium <laughs> Falcon. And I don't know if they can bank on them solely for a second time. Thanks. How dare you trip over the name Millennium <laughs> Falcon. Millennium. Uh, Perry, I think we're gonna see a whole lot of Luke Skywalker in the marketing material for episode eight, because if you guys remember, we didn't see him in episode seven and any of the posters, any of the TV as we barely saw the guy in the damn movie. So you think they're going to lean heavily on a classic character like a Luke Skywalker. As much as I love Princess Lee and everything she's about or Chewbacca or even the Millennium Falcon, nothing is going to sell this movie better than seeing Luke Skywalker, maybe with a lightsaber in his hand, maybe teaching Ray, maybe just with that far off stare in his eyes that we got at the end of Force Awakens. How much do you think we're going to see Luke Skywalker on the promo material? for episode eight. I am guessing that most of what you just said is going to be saved for the actual movie. I don't Ooh. think this promo campaign needs him because we still, not only do we still have the Millennium Falcon and Leia, mm -hmm. but we also have all the other characters that they just made super popular from The Force Awakens. You don't need Luke Skywalker to sell episode eight, but given that he was not in the promos for episode seven, I think he's going to be featured to some extent. Like, maybe a quick shot in a trailer. He's finally gonna get his own character poster, stuff like that, but I have a feeling anything that hints at his involvement in the narrative I, or at least I hope, is going to be safe for the actual film. Well, something I'm really excited about doing again when episode eight comes out is just diving into every piece of promo that comes out and being like, what does this mean? What is this? What are they trying to indicate to us? When we were at D23, the convention that Disney holds every other year in Anaheim, they released, I think it was the first poster for Force Awakens, which is something that Drew Struzan did, and you had Han Solo in the shot with Finn and with Rey, and those are the three characters, and there's some other little you know drawings on the side there, but we're like, oh, wow, so it looks like Han Solo is going to be maybe the most seen classic character in Force Awakens. And then we got the huge poster of everybody in there, except for Luke Skywalker. I think Luke's definitely going to be on that poster, mm -hmm. that style poster oh, for absolutely. episode eight. I might go so far as to say, I think you would see Luke Skywalker on the very first poster that gets released for episode eight. I think it's going to be a teaser poster and it's going to be a cryptic looking Luke Skywalker. Maybe, you know, the shots, the character posters with the lightsaber. Mm -hmm. Maybe even though the big moment at the end of Force Awakens is him taking off the hood, maybe with the hood on and just the lightsaber illuminating his face. Disney, you can have my idea. I think it's great. Well, a cryptic Luke Skywalker is still a Luke Skywalker. <laughs> what if they did that Return of the Jedi poster where it's the two hands holding the lightsaber up, but you just get his weird robot. What the hell happened to his hand? <laughs> What what happened? It, it was so normal looking in Return of the Jedi. He just had the glove on. Is he just going gloveless from now on? My mind just immediately went to that whole thing with the floating hand in space now. That's all I'm picturing. <laughs> There's it just, a hand it out just there floated somewhere. away. <laughs> they abandoned that idea and out to space it went. Sinead, either tell us where the hand is or let's get to number two. <laughs> Brantley Foster writes, hey all, I've been a fan for years and movie talk is my favorite no, show. No, it's no sweat, thanks. <laughs> With the continuing <laughs> decline of viewers for broadcasted award shows, such as the Academy Awards and the Oscars, do you think that any of those ceremonies will eventually stop being televised? I stopped watching the ceremonies years ago because they are just too damn long. I have Netflix, multiple Collider videos, and new movies to catch up on, and I cannot afford that much time to a three plus hour ceremony when I can get the highlights almost as soon as it's over. Thanks for taking my question and tell Baby Carrots to keep the joke's coming. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think this could happen down the line, not in the near future. If anything, I think in the near future, we might see a drastic shift in format, maybe condensing it, which is a little sad because now that I'm saying that, you know, you always have awards for award shows being awarded, not during the telecast. Mm -hmm. And 
it feels like those people should be recognized in the same way, but they are not because otherwise we would end up with like a 10 hour telecast and that wouldn't get any views at all. But there is no doubt that awards shows in general, I think the Emmys, this one was the all time low in viewership or like the all time low in like eight years or something. And then we have a whole bunch of other award shows that are hitting rock bottom. The one stat that stood out to me was uh, the VMAs, which I think last year had 10 million viewers and this year it was 6.5. I also thought it was a sucky telecast. Oh so. boy, but they tried hard. Oh Ugh. my God. I was watching the VMAs with my girlfriend and man, they gave a hell of an effort for three hours. Is that, are you saying that in a positive way? I'm I think they, they were trying. They tried their ass off. Try too damn hard. They tried really hard. I like me some Key and Peel. They were annoying. Yeah. Me. Oh my God. But Beyonce gave like her entire concert during that award. <laughs> the show. Beyonce thing was amazing. It like, was so good. I was just good. watching that and I was like, what do I do now? Do I go work out? Like, I'm inspired. I just yeah, don't know what, so where, where do I put this energy? A lot of it was amazing. But then you have these shows that are essentially taking away views from their own telecast by then going online and putting clips from your show in your video video player right after they happen. I well, I don't understand why you would do that. And I think the Emmys was doing that with YouTube videos. They were putting YouTube clips out almost immediately after something would happen. So why would someone watch the whole show? It's like a harbinger of our times, though, is that it's not just award shows that have declining ratings. It's network TV in general has ratings that are going down, even cable for that matter. What's funny is that we're talking about not seeing as many award shows on television when the amount of content that could be nominated for an award yeah. is so per permanent in our culture right now. Like, there's so many different outlets that should have their own award show, but we're not going to see it on TV because the ratings aren't there. I think you're going to continue to see them on television for a while for no other reason because the, an award show is one of those things that works better on TV than I think it does streaming because it's an immediacy to it. There's there's a secrecy to award shows. You know, like nobody knows where that Price Waterhouse Cooper's briefcase has been for the Oscars until it gets delivered and then we read the name. So you can't really have like an award ceremony on Netflix because you'd have to tape it ahead of time unless you can somehow stream it live, which I guess they could do within a few years. I don't care about lots of award shows, so seeing their declining ratings doesn't bug me. I do think the Oscars is gonna be around for a while in the current format. And look, there's a lot of inventive producers out there. There's a lot of creative minds that can find a way to either condense the show or get more eyeballs on it, find some sort of way, which is what the VMAs was clearly trying to do, was to be so shocking. And so I can't believe this is happening and this is happening. Let's let Kanye talk for 20 minutes because he'll say something crazy. And it just didn't pay off, I think, in the way that they wanted it it's to. It's weird because it went the exact opposite and they wound up losing a viewer, a significant amount of their viewership. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so do you, uh, do you see award shows going away, Sinead, as far as them being broadcast on television? I mean, I think that down the line, it's a very big possibility, but but they're always going to have to be filmed because people now love to tune in and watch clips mm -hmm. online. So I think regardless, we're always going to have a way to watch them. I don't see the big issue of it being online more than on television. Um, and I think they do that because they know there are people who just w want to cut all the crap out and just watch certain speeches or certain performances and whatever. Um, but I know that smaller award shows have already started making that transition. Like last year, the Streamies was on VH1, I believe. Believe. And they, I know that they announced that they're not going to be televising it this year. They haven't said exactly what they're going to do, but chances are they're going to live stream it. And I feel like there's a genuine interest in live stream events right now. So I don't see that being a horrible thing if it ever co comes to that. But like you said, ratings are down all across the board. Like people aren't watching as much TV anymore because we don't have to. So that's going to, it's going to kind of weed out. Like one's going to get lower and lower before the others. And there's not as much interest in, in award shows as there were a few years ago, you know? So I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't think it's going to happen for a very long time. Well, I look forward to hosting the 95th Annual Academy Awards, which you can catch on Facebook Live. And the award for best dinosaur question goes to... <laughs> Xander Tanigawa. <laughs> he writes, Hey, Collider Crew. So this mailbag question involves the Jurassic World 2 theory, and I'd love to hear Perry's thoughts since she's a fan of the series like I am. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Days ago, I googled images of Jurassic World and discovered a photo of the director, Colin Trevorrow, with concept art, and one of them was a stegoceratops. What? Which is a hybrid of a stegosaurus, a triceratops, a beetle, and a snake. <laughs> Why do you throw a beetle in there? I don't know. There was reasons. You can go on the, the Jurassic Park wiki page and actually read the reasons why they incorporated those okay. things. 
Oh, uh, my. All right. According <laughs> to Trevaro, this hybrid was originally going to appear in the film in a scene where Owen and Claire encounter it in the jungle, discovering that Dr. Henry Wu was making more hybrids in secrecy, but was cut from the script due to Trevaro's son saying that if they had Stegoceratops along with Indominus Rex, the Irex would feel less special. Mm -hmm. The Stegoceratops can be seen on the computer monitors inside the Hammond Creation Lab. My question is, do you think this whole time they were hinting at us with an Easter egg of what the sequel is going to be about, that Dr. Wu is creating dinosaur hybrids, which they've told us that the sequel would be different from the series? Thanks, and love to hear your thoughts. Well, as the one on this panel that is dressed like Dr. John Hammond, I feel the most Ooh. qualified to Ooh. answer this question. I like um, that. I love the idea of this. I think it's a great way to take what we saw in Jurassic World and further the lore because my big issue walking out of Jurassic World, which I love the movie, is Colin Trevorrow chewed up a lot of things in there that I don't know that there's a, a, a believable way to go with the sequel. But it, because I didn't really care about the military line anymore, like, oh, we're just going to breed these things and they're going to be used for militaristic adventures. But if you're talking about Dr. Henry Wu, who I always loved, I was like, oh, no, he's cute. He's, he's, he's making dinosaurs. It's fun. If he is now kind of a bad guy who's making these different breeds and not telling anybody about it, I don't know that that's the way that I want to pin my entire sequel on Perry, but it'd be an interesting thread in there. How do you see the Stegoceratops? Figuring in to Jurassic World 2. By the way, you're a little more Dennis Nedry than John Hammond. John Hammond does wear a button-down collared shirt, but Dennis Nedry has a little, like, florally print going on. And I do like my sweets, and I florally. do shave with Barbasol, so <laughs> you're very right. <laughs> um, for the record, too, a beetle was used in its creation to give it an exoskeletal armor. Ooh. So it see? does have value. I'm sorry I made fun of the beetle. I love y'all's rock band. <laughs> I just didn't know that a beetle could really provide any sort of help for a dinosaur. I've been proven wrong. I like this idea, though. I wish they had incorporated this in the movie and not the military aspect, because that mm -hmm. essentially went nowhere and almost left Jurassic World at the end, with, like almost a dead end position where I didn't, I don't care where they take that element of the story whatsoever. Whereas, if they had enhanced the Doctor character and focused more on him as a villain, because that was another problem with the movie, is B.D. Wong in the first movie is just like the nicest, smiliest guy ever. And then all of a sudden he's got an agenda in Jurassic World. Mm -hmm. Whereas if, th if this was what he was planning all along and we knew his reasoning behind it and then it was revealed, are we talking Jurassic World spoilers? I guess we can. Yes, we can talk yeah, Jurassic World it's, spoilers. It's been There's long dinosaurs enough. and they get out of control. It just crossed my mind after the fact, which is a very helpful thing. But I... I like this idea. I wish this is the route that they were going with before. I don't necessarily think it's going to work now with the sequel, though, because I don't think they planted the seed strongly enough in the first one. It really just seemed like that first one was, unlike like The Force Awakens was a sequel, it was a return to prominence for a franchise, and it gave us so many different avenues we can go in the next one. Jurassic World, I felt like we, we took it to a lot of exciting places, but a lot of those would lead to a dead end in another movie. Like, the military thing, I just, it, it's not as intriguing anymore. If they had left us with that nugget at the end, and then maybe that was something we could have explored. Maybe I'd be more excited about it. Them breeding different sorts of animals and incorporating them into one beast sounds cool, but we just saw that with the Indominus Rex. Mm -hmm. So even if they gave us little notes of it in Jurassic World and they want to explore that more, how do you do that? Because we just had this national disaster, this international, this global thing happen that every news media outlet's going to be covering for years. So where do we take this? That was my question leaving, and I still don't have a, a satisfying answer. Well, I have a really important question for you. What's up? If you can combine two dinosaurs mm -hmm. of your choice, what would they be? Because uh, I, I would, thought a lot about I this. Would, I would honor uh, our, our dear friend JTE from the Schmoes No Show, uh -oh. and I would do a Triceratops. Was that what it was, Cody? It was a tri <laughs> what? A, a Trisanatoratops, yeah. He was trying to answer on the Schmoes No Show. He got a question about what, what animal, I can't remember what the question was, but it was like, what animal what was this? Or what, what animal was injured at the beginning of Jurassic Park? And he's like, oh, a, a Triceratoratops. <laughs> it was the funniest thing that we've ever had happen on the show. Oh my so God. I will honor you, JT. I'm going to remind him of that often now. Uh, I, he gets it. I think the coolest thing might be if you did 
a brachiosaurus and a dilophosaurus. So it's like this super tall thing that just like splits black goo all over the field, you know, because it's so big. Right, right. I was worried that you were just making a giant vegetarian, but you're right. <laughs> the, the the dilophosaurus actually has some some goo that you yeah, can spread. Yeah. How about see? I'm such a T Rex hunk. Like I am such a fan of the Tyrannosaurus Rex. I wanted to be one you for a long time. You just call yourself a T Rex hunk? I I'm, I'm a T Rex <laughs> hunk. But, I mean, okay. I've been described as a T-Rex honk at various shows I've done after hours uh, in Vegas. What I is just, a, what's a honk? What's a honk? A honk? It, it's like uh, somebody who's a, who's very a, a, an ardent fan of something. It's like, man, I'm a huge, like you, you're a huge donut honk, you know? Okay. You let Perry's a huge dinosaur honk. I've never used that phrase before, but we should just refer to you as the T-Rex hunk from now on, right? I think if you cross me a with a T-Rex, I think that's a pretty badass yeah. animal. Mm -hmm. Jurassic World 2 right there. <laughs> what kind of dinosaur are you making? Um, my favorite dinosaur has always been the Brontosaurus because I feel like he's the sweetest, <laughs> honestly. But I also really like the T-Rex. So I would mix those two together because you have one meat eater and one plant eater. So then they balance <laughs> each other out perfectly. And then the Brontosaurus will be like the sweet side and the T-Rex will be the mean side. So therefore, it's kind of creating like the most perfect dinosaur I'm ever. just trying to picture what that might look like. And all it would I, just be like all I could picture, humongous. All I could picture is like a Brontosaurus with like, with with like the extra little, little arms. <laughs> Shame. I think if you would stop relying on the food guide pyramid to tell you how to make a dinosaur uh, we'd all realize the coolest dinosaur is a t-rex and a pterodactyl all boom right. next question sam dean bobby castile writes hello Clyder. i love your show every year has its big budget bomb this year's of course being ben hur my question is of the upcoming movies in 2017 which do you think have a chance to bomb at the box office my pick would be the great wall or valerian and the city of a thousand planets thanks and may the force be with you i hope it's not valerian i got to see some really cool footage from valerian mm -hmm. at comic-con this year and it really surprised me and i'm really excited for luke Besson to get to do something so out there and crazy and creative like that but you know it's it's not a bad prediction because when you have a wacky movie like that it's not easy to sell but i hope it doesn't bomb paramount i guess already predicted this for us though with monster trucks where they're already yeah. put, what is it like a 115 million dollar loss paramount is already before the movie oh, comes out God. paramount is already predicting a 115 million dollar oh, so loss sad. that for the poor company. movie i was mm. on the set of that movie like two years ago at this point and it was a fun set visit so i'm a little sad for them but then again that trailer is not what i thought it was gonna yeah, be when it came really, out no. but I think my real prediction for this is the King Arthur movie, because that's mm. another movie that's a really tough sell. And Guy Ritchie's last movie, I think it was Man From U.N.C.L.E., did not do too hot at the box office, even though it had two pretty big names in the lead. So I don't think King Arthur is going to do very well. That's right. And that movie looks like it has really nice production values, too. So yeah. they put a pretty penny into it. And I'm just not sure that there's ever been that much of an appetite to see this. I mean, we tried to go back to that world a number of times with different filmmakers, different interpretations of it. And it never seems like it catches on that much with an audience going all the way back to when it did in 1975's classic Monty Python and the Holy Grail, still the greatest King Arthur movie that will ever be made. Um, if I'm looking at some of the movies that are coming out, and these are like the high profile movies, we're not talking about like The Nut Job 2, I don't expect to crush you to the box office. I don't expect it to lose that much money. The Emoji movie is something that I'm a little trepidatious about. It's got an August release Why? date. Why? It sounds like a great idea. It, mm -hmm. uh, I'm if, just if you, kidding. I, if you compare record. that to a Tetris movie, then yes, maybe. <laughs> even though I love Tetris, I am actually going to go with the Barbie movie. There's a Barbie movie that oh, is coming out. Oh, you're so out. wrong. Um, you are so wrong. The Barbie franchise question. is so big, and people, they make, they roll out those TV movies for Barbie all the time because it has such a huge viewing. I, I, I don't have, I never want to have children. I don't know what the kids are into these days, but it seems like kids grow up a lot faster. They're on their cell phones before you know it. So I didn't know that kids still grow up playing with Barbies for a long period of time. Oh, wow. I forgot this was a thing. Diablo no. Cody rewrote it. Mm -hmm. hmm. I can't, I honestly, like I, I've, of the Barbie movies I've seen, I think they're awful. I think they're horrible kids movies. They're just not very good, but there is a reason why there's so many all the time. Can I ask you guys an honest question because you guys are females and I assume you guys had Barbies at some point in no. your lives as my older sister did? I had ne the Ninja Turtles and Power Rangers. This is we why know you this. kick ass. Yeah. This is why you're awesome. I, I had G.I. Joe's, okay? And so as an adult male, I get excited when I hear G.I. Joe is making a movie because I love playing with them as a kid. Right. Just hearing about a Barbie movie, Sinead, yeah, no. uh -uh. get you to want to <laughs> see it? Or is this going to be a gem in the hologram situation where it's like, yeah, I grew up with that, but Ooh. I don't care about it now. And the 
the young fan base that they might be going after is no longer invested in Barbie. I just I haven't checked Mattel's stock in a while. I don't know if people are still buying Barbies, Barbies like they used to. Just doesn't seem like a summer movie landing in the right place for me. All right, what's our next story? <laughs> Wait, for the record, I don't even think this Barbie has the Barbie movie even been shot yet. I have no I, idea. I have, we haven't heard anything about I don't it. Know. I don't know. It was slated for a summer 2017 I am, release date. I am now not, not putting my money on that movie bombing. I'm putting my money on that on release it, date being not pushed Not coming back. out? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. consider that a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> if, it, if it doesn't even happen, then it means it made zero dollars okay. in 2017. I'll give you that. Yeah, well, we'll just have to see about that, okay? We'll see. I, look, hey, my sister used to play. She used to take my G.I. Joes, and then she'd play. The G.I. Joes would date her Barbies. Aww. And it was always really tough because the G.I. Joes are like a third the size of Barbies. So they That's totally awkward. got bossed around that house. <laughs> All right, Jerry Crochet writes, Hey guys, love your show. It is my number one go-to show that I watch every day and on the weekends. I had a discussion with a few friends over the weekend and they were surprised that I've never seen a James Bond film. I'm not sure why, but I just never wanted to watch them. Same goes for the Bourne series. Something about spy movies, I guess. I love watching <laughs> movies, but I wondered if my lack of appeal to certain films is common among other movie buffs. And is there a movie franchise that has just no appeal to you despite how successful they are? And if so, why? I can't think of a movie franchise that I'm like, I can't stand watch. I've never seen a Bridget Jones movie. And, uh, you know, she obviously just had a baby who may or may not be the Blair Witch. So I don't know that that's going to be the thing that gets me into the theaters to see that franchise. If I the just, baby was the Blair Witch, I would go see Bridget Jones. I think it's a kick-ass backstory. It's a nice brand, brand marriage there. But most of the franchise I've been able to check out, like there, there was some that I was late to the party to. I was actually a little late to Die Hard. Like I didn't. I, I think I saw it in high school when I, uh, for the first time, and when I saw it, I obviously fell in love with all the Die Hard movies. But it's a little late to that one. But if you want to see some really good action, I would recommend checking out both the Bourne and the James Bond movies. They're a lot of fun. Start with some of the Sean Connery ones, and then if you like that vibe, you can go into Roger Moore. If you want something a little more modern, a little more gritty, check out some of the Daniel Craig ones. This question actually hit mine, which tends to be spy movies, and it's not that I won't see them or avoid them or just hate them in general. It's just... When you're talking about a new, you know, horror movie or even a comedy featuring some of my favorite actors and actresses out there versus a new James Bond movie, I will just naturally gravitate towards one versus the other. Mm -hmm. And it, it basically is, it's not just spies in particular, it's mostly movies with like your typical A-list star taking down a whole bunch of people. So it's like I felt the same way about Mission Impossible movies also. And then I went through a phase mm -hmm. where I binged all the Mission Impossible movies to catch up to whatever I was covering that year. And I fell in love with those movies. So even though in the marketing phase, I might not gravitate towards that kind of movie, it's not like I'm closed off to it. I just need to try it first and then I could get into it. Right, James Bond is a crazy one because there's so many James Bond exactly. movies. So, like there's three Bridget Jones movies, there's five Die Hard really there's three and a half diehards but a james bond movie what what would be the james bond movie since you aren't a huge fan of the spy genre can you name one james bond movie you think somebody should start with casino royale is by far my favorite james that that's the one that kind of opened the door for me to that franchise and made me a little more excited i think that is just a fantastic movie in every single that respect. was the gateway drug for you it, yeah that here's is what my i'll say drug. is that i love casino royale it is one of my favorite bond movies it's one of my favorite action movies of all time but i don't feel like that's the best entry point into seeing like if i like this i'll like other bond movies no, i think the best I, starting yeah, point the is pierce brosnan's first outing as bond in goldeneye because hmm. that had a lot of classic bondisms but it was a little more modern too so if you like something like that you might be more prone to going back and experiencing some of the crazier bonds to get a little silly like Moonraker something like that you can go all the way back to Thunderball and 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 Dr. No if you want to start at the beginning Goldfinger that kind of thing so I think that you should check out Goldeneye first and then move on from there. Shane, Does you have any, the like, GoldenEye game count? The GoldenEye game oh, is God. something. God, I'm so oh. bad at that game. That what? actually it's, it's might be my gateway drug to Bond stuff. That is because the I best love that game. by far. It's the only reason I still have a Nintendo 64 <laughs> is for I, 007 my GoldenEye. My friends used to play that in college, and it's like, I just got my ass. I was the guy just like running around, doesn't know where he is. I was free points in GoldenEye, which is a bummer because I'm really good at like Halo. Like I picked up Halo really fast. Just something about GoldenEye, could not get it done. I love Goldeneye. Um, franchises that I haven't. Yes, yeah, is there any big big gaps in your I movie mean, watching? For the for the most part, I think I've seen at least like one movie from all the major franchises. But one that comes to mind is um, 
uh, Star Trek. I haven't really mm. gotten into that one too much. Okay. And Lord of the Rings. Mm. Like, I've tried and I've watched bits and pieces of Lord of the Rings, probably more so than Star Trek, um, because my family was super into Lord of the Rings. But for some reason, it just like, it did not grab and hold my interest. Well, like, both I was of never them like. involve people going on a mission. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can't do it. Yeah, can't do not it. a lot of big things happen in there. All right, Thomas George writes, Hey guys, what do you think is more beneficial to a director's career, a best director or best picture win at the Oscars or a very successful box office? Thanks and keep up the great content. I don't think there is one answer to this question. I think it is just based on what you as a director want to accomplish over the course of your career. But if we're talking about someone who wants to go on and have the opportunity to have some flexibility to pick and choose their projects and have control, I would definitely say it's box office because I don't think you can either narrow it down. We can't really just talk about uh, Academy Award wins either because if you go back, especially in the past decade, it's not like some newcomer ever came on the scene and won the Oscar and then went on to have some sort of career because of that. The only non-name that comes to mind when I think of even just best directing nominees is the director of Beasts of the Southern Wild. And what happened to him, uh, uh, Ben Zeitlin, Zetlin? I thought he was gonna be huge and get all the opportunities. And you know, he got that nomination and I haven't seen or heard from him since. It really is weird that sometimes you see somebody win the most prestigious award in film and it still doesn't act as a spur to their career going to the next phase. Sometimes it does, sometimes it does, whether it's an actor, an actress, or somebody that's behind the camera. I would agree with you that I think that if you're just talking about, hey, I love making movies, I wanna make a movie that I wanna ensure that I get another job offer after that movie's finished, it's gonna be box office. I think this is much more a thing for actors because because of just the face value of being mm -hmm. on the ceremony, getting the award, being able to be billed as Academy Award winner, blah, blah, from this movie. I feel like it's much more valuable for an actor. I, you know, this question would be a lot tougher to answer if we're talking about actors now that I think about it because a box office draw as an actor, I mean, because how many people can you think of actor wise that are legit box office draws where they deliver every single time beyond you know maybe a tom cruise it gets less and less and less every year it seems like that you can put somebody on a poster and reliably I mean passengers is going to try to do it apparently it's like hey we got chris pratt we got jennifer mm -hmm. lawrence don't worry about what the movie's about this is the poster come see our movie we'll see how it goes yeah versus like when you're talking about the oscar situation with an actor whereas you know where they might not deliver at the box office with a particular mm -hmm. movie once they get that oscar win that is stuck to their name i mean obviously it's stuck to a director's name as well but in a very different way you ever feel like you're get just getting hit over the head with awards when you see a trailer for a movie and it's like Academy Award bleh, and Academy Award winner bleh, and Academy Award it's like fine I'll go see your movie you got famous people in it my favorite is when you have like three actors billed as the lead and it's like Academy Award winner this Academy Award winner this and then him <laughs> and Rob Schneider <laughs> Aw, shame I, I like this big one all right what, what's our next question Stephen writes hi all greetings from Australia I've been following your show since the beginning on AMC and look forward to catching up with you with all of you every day. I never miss a show and like many others, really appreciate the hard work and effort that everyone contributes that makes Collider the best on YouTube. Well, it's tough, Steven, but somebody's gotta do it. <laughs> I recently met Carl Urban at the Brisbane Comic Con and I asked him about the Dread Netflix series that has been discussed. He told me negotiations are happening Ooh. and he would love to play Dread again. After listening to another question on Mailbag recently about Dune, the film and series, it got me thinking about what other films would translate better as a series. Steven. Um, I'm going to say one that a lot of people might be surprised <laughs> to hear me say that is Men in Black. I think Men in Black is a good one to go with, but it doesn't feel like my answer is really being listened to right now. It feels like it's falling on deaf ears because the ladies are giggling about something that I'm not aware of. Now, either I have a boogie hanging or I said something stupid or maybe Sinead had something happen at the end that I didn't pay attention to. Maybe you guys know what we're talking about. I'm in the dark here. <laughs> Illuminate kind of me, ladies. Too. I wrote the notes. <laughs> What's this that? Uh, I don't I just, it's, Oh boy, uh, now I gotta go back. Steven. No, it wasn't anything. It's just the way, it's just me <laughs> ending the notes with Steven. That's Steven. it. Steven. That's literally why we're laughing. That was the payoff? <laughs> yes. Oh, man, I thought like. That's, uh, that's, that's, well, she started giggling, I heard her. <laughs> she starts giggling, I can't stop. 
It's the yeah, Collider news was... effect. The giggles are contagious. I wanted yeah. there to be something funny that happened. Like, yeah. I thought maybe, like, you know, <laughs> no. some sort of uh, sexual innuendo. No, it's not as a... good as you having a boogie hanging. <laughs> uh, yeah, what is? But I will go back to my answer then, which is Men in Black, because uh. I feel like that, that film franchise, I actually like what they're trying to do with the crossover with, jo- with 21 Jump Street, because if it doesn't work, who cares? The 21 Jump Street movies can still go on, and they'll just act like Men in Black was <laughs> a, a bad experience with flatulence that we never have to talk about again. But if you do a series about Men in Black, maybe you can make it a little more serious. Maybe you can keep the comedic tone of the first movie. I want to see adventures with the Men in Black. It was something I always grew up loving, X-Files. When they announced they were making a Men in Black movie, I'm like, this is what I want to see. I think that it'd be a great Netflix series. What about you, Perry? I actually agree. I forget how much I love Men in Black, and then all of a sudden it's on when I'm just flipping through the channels. Mm And I love it. I leave it and I watch the whole thing. Yep. I think that's a great idea. This exact question actually crossed my mind while I was watching the new Magnificent Seven because my big problem with that movie was that there wasn't enough character development and character moments and team building. And I, I don't really know where you would go with a narrative. Like, can they go and save town to town? I don't mean anything like that. <laughs> I just, I am referring to spending time with these really cool characters that I really liked and wish had a little more character development. Another thing I was thinking about is Hunger Games. Why are we talking about making a prequel movie when you could have a TV series about it? And I mean, there's just so many things to explore, especially if you're talking about showing more than one district and what life was like when the Hunger Games just started. I think there's just so much potential there. And then I just love Mad Max, so give me a TV series set in the Mad Max world. Any sort of Mad Max. I think think Dread's a good idea too, though. Like, uh-huh. Dread is, and, and hearing that Carl Urban is, they're talking about negotiations, stuff like that. I didn't like Dread. I, I didn't like that. I, oh. I did not like it. Maybe I can go back and revisit it. It's one of those ones that I always get hate for, for not liking. It just didn't resonate How with me the first time. How many times have you seen it? Uno. Okay. Did you happen to see it at Comic-Con? That would be no. Oh, I because I was ta- I forget who I was talking to in the office, but I saw it at that Comic Con screening where mm-hmm. everybody walked out and was like dread, 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 and I, I think I gave it like a C or something. Yeah. I did didn't like it at all, and it's one of those things. It similar to Men in Black when it's on TV or I have an opportunity to watch it at home. I I love it. Just. You should give it another try. I I will give it a shot. If that's the one that i got to give it a shot, I certainly will. To you ladies and to Steven, thanks for giving the girls a chuckle here. And now we have our last question. Patricio writes, hey, Collider crew, very important question. In the case of a zombie apocalypse, which member of the Collider crew would outlast the rest of the crew? Who would be Hmm. the first to go? My money is on Mark Ellis, outlasting everyone else with his high charisma stats, making up for his relatively low constitution, (laughs) with Matt Nost a close second for similar reasons. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to have to take issue. Thank you for the high charisma praise. I'm not sure that charm helps you in a zombie apocalypse. I'm (laughs) I'm pretty sure you can't sweet talk a walker into them not biting you but what's the low constitution is is he implying that i have like a that, that i i can like i can turn on somebody in a moment like if i can act friendly with you guys but i'll feed you to the wolves if it means saving my ass i will support you on that i don't see you ever doing that in any situation oh thank you very yeah. much you might be wrong and i might be luring you into a trap <laughs> yeah, when the zombie really. apocalypse does now hit. we know who will die first so you, you you think you're one of the first ones to get off if uh we all turn into zombies all right so this is my problem with this question if i'm answering the question i think i would actually say you're gonna survive just because I know you run and I take my zombie land rules mm-hmm. very seriously and I think running will serve a person very very well 25 miles at least every week however I think that the who would be the first to go question I need to put every single person on this team on that list that owns a pet because I think I'd be great in a zombie apocalypse I can run I'll like beat the crap out of zombies <laughs> my problem is If there was a zombie apocalypse right now and you're like, you know, go run and hide or whatever, the first thing I would do is go back to my apartment and get my cat. And he would meow and attract all the walkers, and I would die in a heartbeat. Dewey is going to be the death of you. Uh, Can I I ask a question? What What if Dewey's a zombie? I might. I, I don't know. That question upsets me. Wait, would you be like Michonne? Like you keep him I, on a leash anyway in, in hopes that one day you can <laughs> save him? I wish that's where my mind went first. I pictured more like the governor where I would just like keep Dewey in a cage and just save him forever or like something in hopes that or or like the barn where I'm just hoping that one day someone will find a cure and it'll turn him it, and turn him back into a you cat. You know what? It's not the worst thing to have because if Molly became a zombie too then like Dewey and Molly could play and if they get in a fight it's like who cares they're zombies. That would be an epic zombie team up movie if the two of us were just like trying to survive with our zombified pets. It'd be like zombie Milo and Otis. 
Who Why wouldn't want to see that? Why isn't that a thing? That is a great idea, Sinead. Do you want to build off our movie, or would you rather just you answer the question? You can bring Britney Spears. My turtle. My yeah. turtle. Would, my turtle would die immediately. Your turtle's name is Britney Spears. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> but honestly, though, if a turtle got zombie, do you think it would get like bigger and more evil? I don't no. know why I'm about to say this, but what if like reptiles are immune? It seems like something that's, yeah. I'd buy that. But well, you guys, thing? she's like the size of like a, a, a dollar coin. She's not going to protect me in a zombie apocalypse. So even if she is she immune. She won't protect you, but it's not like a cat or a dog. Like she won't right. make a peep and you can just put her in your pocket. <laughs> that's true. Snakes might already I could be put zombies. put her in my pocket. You know, well, like reptiles, lizards, they might already be zombified. Oh. Science hasn't proven otherwise. Um, what I will say is that I, I hate to throw somebody who's actually in the room under the bus, uh -oh. but I think the first one to die in a zombie apocalypse here at Collider is going to be our beloved engineer, Adam. Um, because, <laughs> because you're such a nice dude. Like he's the nicest guy. And so I feel like if a zombie was about to attack me, he'd be like, hey, Mark, you know what? I got this one. You go ahead with your high charisma, your low constitution. Have a great day. I'll see you as the zombies bite. Really he's like, good hey, have a great impression. one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it with with uh, similar reasons. I act actually think the first one to go would be Frank. <laughs> you think Frank is just too nice? He's just like, that makes me feel awful. Like I need to go give him a hug after this. He can't hear me though, cause he's not in the room, so it's fine. But he um, is so like quiet and, and so nice and just like so helpful that I feel like he would be one of those people who tries to take on the zombies by himself. Yeah, too. they just lay their lives down. Now somebody who's on camera here that I think would get eaten early in the process is John Schnepp, because I think mm. that Schnepp would get angry at the zombie. You start yelling at him, he'd get in like some sort of debate over like whether Dune should be a movie or a TV show with a horde of zombies and then he would just run in screaming and Schnepp would be the guy that the zombies would flock to first. And I gotta say, I like Paranized Chances because mm -hmm. like she said, we just we are fleet of foot and zombies, as we know, are not the most athletic breed. So I think I would just like them. to point out that um, two years in a row, I ran in the Junior Olympics. So I believe that I would survive the zombie apocalypse. I, I mean, every town has some sort of junior Olympics. No, it's it was a like... national junior Olympics. If there's one thing that I that I know I can do, it's run. And I 100% believe that running is the key to survival in a zombie Harry, apocalypse. Harry, if you're cool with this, uh, Sinead, welcome to the team. I Thanks. think I can give you a pass. Let's Thanks, do guys. it. Thanks. All right, well, the three of us are going to survive a zombie apocalypse. How about you out there? In the meantime, make sure you guys comment right now and let us know. What did you think of all of the answers to your questions on today's episode of Mailbag? Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe right here, Collider Video on YouTube. And, of course, keep firing in those questions. Be as original as possible. We love the zombie questions as much as we love the DC and Marvel questions. ColliderVideo at gmail.com is the place to send it. I want to thank the panel both in behind the camera, first of all. Adam, thank you very much. <laughs> Cody uh, left for some reason. Wendy is still here, not paying attention to me either. They're both goners in the zombie apocalypse. And the people that are actually going to survive up here with me. Sinead DeFries, where can the kids find you? I'm online at Sinead DeFries, and that's, that's so Sinead.com. On Mondays here, hosting Collider TV Talk. On Fridays, hosting Movie Talk. And here on Mailbag over the weekends. And make sure you follow her pet's Twitter account, at Britney Spears underscore turtle. <laughs> Perry, where can the kids find you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at PNMROF. On Collider Nightmares every Tuesday best of the week every Saturday Stephen <laughs> tonight I will be telling jokes at the world famous comedy store I hope they hit as hard as the Stephen joke you guys get tickets to my website MarkLSlive.com oh and a reminder I'll be at New York Comic Con in a couple weeks at New York Comedy Club on October 6th two shows that I'm headlining get tickets at MarkLSlive.com until next time we will see you guys soon Stephen <laughs> Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.